Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, today we have a uh, the third in a series of four training sessions about Galaxy Australia. Um, and what we're going to do is focus on Galaxy Australia as a tool to analyse um, RNA-seq data, expression data from RNA-seq data. Uh, my name's Jeff Christensen and I'm from the EMBL Australia Bioinformatics Resource. Um, if you don't know what EMBL ABR is, um, we're a distributed national research infrastructure and we provide bioinformatics support to support life science researchers in Australia. Uh, we currently have 13 nodes across the country uh, shown here and so all of you will be uh, sitting in, a, in a, a, a place that's associated with one of these nodes. Um, all of us undertake or support bioinformatics research and activities around several key areas and they are data, compute, tools, platforms, standards and training. So um, a major priority across all of that, all of EMBL ABR and most of the nodes is bioinformatics training and this is why Galaxy Australia has partnered with uh, the nodes um, that you're associated with to deliver this series of national training events. Um, in this short training session, as I said, we'll explore Galaxy Australia and that's an open access, free to use portal for all Australian life science researchers uh, and it's used to perform data manipulation and analysis. Um, and we'll also be looking at how it can be used to analyse differential gene expression using RNA-seq data. Today we're going to be using uh, bacterial data as the examples. So we have uh, very excited to have 112 attendees registered across 11 sites um, and those are in five Australian states and also in Malaysia at Monash Malaysia. The lead trainer today is Dr Anna Syme, um, who is the bioinformatics training lead on the Galaxy Australia service. And she's based at Melbourne Bioinformatics, where she works on microbial genomics. Her previous research includes studies in crustacean biology and systematics, mapping the evolutionary gain and loss of complex characters, and using molecular data to investigate the special speciation rates of taxonomic groups such as Australian grasses. Um, as well as working at uh, Melbourne Bioinformatics, Anna's worked at Museum Victoria, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and the Royal Botanic Gardens, uh, Melbourne. Uh, in addition to Anna, who's the lead trainer today, we have a lot of facilitators around the country. So we have 15 across the participating sites and they've all volunteered their time to enable this training event to occur. Um, they attended a two-day training event several months ago and they've, and they've been organising the event at your node. So um, without their help, this event wouldn't be possible and we'd really like to acknowledge their support um, and their um, work in donating their time and all of their efforts in organising and facilitating this event. Um, at JCU, we have two sites, so Cairns and Townsville, and we're helped by Ashley Wardenberg and Ira Cook at those sites. At USQ in Toowoomba, we have Nilifar Vahegi. In Hobart at the University of Tasmania, Mike Charleston. Uh, in Sydney at the University of Sydney, um, at the Sydney Informatics Hub, we have Rosemary Sadsad and Tracy Chu. And they're also being assisted today by, um, by Susan Corley and Nandan Deshpande from the University of New South Wales. At the University of Queensland in St Lucia in Brisbane, we have Gareth Price and Igor McCoonan helping. And in Adelaide, Juan Carlos Sanchez, who's being helped by Uta Bauman. In Melbourne at Monash, we have a couple of sites. So at Clayton, we have Sonika Tiaki and Yang Hu, who are helping out there. And at Monash, Hudson Sen Wang. Also in Victoria, we have the University of Melbourne where we have Simon Gladman and Jessica Chung. And finally in Kuala Lumpur at Mal Monash, Malaysia, we have Zaral Hanifa. Okay, so before I just hand over to Anna, I'll mention a few housekeeping um, issues. So all of the sites today will generally be in listen only mode while the speakers are talking. Um, at certain times during the session, however, we can unmute certain sites if you wanna ask a question. Uh, so you can talk directly with Anna. Um, you should have been given some post-it notes by your local facilitator. Uh, if you haven't, it's, it's okay. But if you have, um, pretty much we use these to indicate whether something's right or wrong. So if everything's going well, feel free to pop a green post-it note on your computer somewhere where it's visible. However, if you need help, please uh, put the pink post-it note up and the, the, your local facilitator will come and help you. Uh, we also have this, uh, what we call a shared discussion board. So everyone can uh, edit this 
um, and you can uh, raise questions, use it to raise questions, you can use it to answer questions, participate in a uh, discussion. So uh, Anna will also be looking at the discussion board periodically and will be able to answer questions. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention in that particular document, there's a link uh, to EMBL ABR's code of conduct and that outlines the behaviour that's expected at this or any EMBL ABR event, both in the physical location you're located and also in that discussion document. Um, in a nutshell, that uh, code of conduct uh, states that all participants in our events are expected to make the event welcoming for everybody present and to show respect and courtesy to everyone else. So please have a look at that document to make sure you're familiar with its content. Uh, finally, if you want to revisit any part of today's training, um, we will be making, well, this is being recorded and it'll be available um, both from the EMBL ABR website and also the EMBL ABR YouTube channel. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now. I will hand over to Anna, who will now take it away. Thank you, Jeff. I will start sharing my screen. Okay, well, welcome everybody to today's workshop. Um, we are going to be working from a schedule today uh, where I've put it on the screen here. The link is tinyurl.com slash galaxyworkshop3. So all the links to the things that we're using today will be uh, linked into that schedule. So I recommend having that open in a browser tab. So I'll give you a brief overview of the workshop that we're doing today. We're looking at an introduction to Galaxy Australia and we're doing that with a bacterial RNA-seq analysis. Our objectives are to familiarise you with Galaxy Australia. This part will be fairly brief because I know a lot of you are already familiar with Galaxy Australia, but we'll give you enough information so that you can do the workshop today. We will really, really briefly introduce RNA-seq. Obviously, it's a really big topic. We're going to use a cut down data set from bacterial sequencing, and then we're going to use some of the common tools in Galaxy Australia to do an analysis where we actually test for differential gene expression between two groups of samples. So as I said, the introduction obviously is going to be very brief, but hopefully it will show you the, the main steps that we would do in an RNA-seq analysis. We are using a bacterial data set which has been reduced so that it can run in the time frame. We're not using eukaryotic data today. And we're using some of the common tools for RNA-seq, but we won't cover all the available tools and nor will we go into a lot of detail about all the parameters. We'll cover briefly Galaxy Australia and then we'll all uh, log into Galaxy Australia and then we'll do the tutorial with the hands-on exercises for bacterial RNA-seq. Like I said, this is the schedule here. If you lose access to that schedule at any time, just ask one of your local facilitators. And we're going to follow this schedule quite closely, but some of the timing may change a little bit, but we will be finished by five o'clock um, Melbourne time, which will be adjusted for whichever time zone you're in. So it's a three hour workshop. I'd like to acknowledge a lot of the people involved in this project, particularly the local facilitators, as Jeff mentioned at each of the nodes. There's also a lot of people involved in the Galaxy Australia project, which is also called the Devil Project. Um, they do a lot of work behind the scenes, making sure all the um, computers work. I'd um, like to thank everyone at Amble ABR, Christina, Jeff and Pip for helping with all the support to run these workshops. And finally, a lot of people who have contributed training material and also like to thank you all for coming. And this is a brief slide showing all of our funders. So a big thanks to all of them too for all of their support for Galaxy Australia and all the peripheral work that goes into that. So now we'll have a really brief introduction to Galaxy Australia. So you might have used Galaxy Australia before. Um, many of you might have attended one of our earlier workshops. We've held two workshops this year in genome assembly and variant detection and a lot of other workshops running Australia that 
that use the Galaxy Australia platform. So you might have already used Galaxy Australia, but I'm briefly going to cover some of the main features in it, um, just to get you started for today's workshop. So there are lots of Galaxy servers throughout the world. They all look very similar. Galaxy is basically um, accessed via a web page. They all have this central panel here, which is where you can look at the tool that you're using or the results from one of your analyses. They have these tools on the left-hand side. This is called the tool panel and what we call a history on the right-hand side. And this is a record of all your analyses that you've done. So it's got any data sets you've uploaded, and any tools that you've used and their outputs. So just to reiterate, it is the web-based platform which has a lot of compute in the background and it's designed for biologists and it has a lot of these tools which are software tools that have sort of been given what we call a wrapper so that they work in Galaxy Australia. And then Galaxy will keep a record of your um, histories, so all the analyses that you've done. But I would like to point out, do make a note of the data storage policy, which is on the front page when you access Galaxy Australia. So just always know what the policy is um, for the server that you're using and so that you don't um, lose any data. So we're using this Australian Galaxy server today, which is usegalaxy.org.au. There are some other main Galaxy Australias in, uh, galaxies in the world. There's um, usegalaxy.org, which is the main one in the USA. And there's also a big European Galaxy server, usegalaxy.eu. So the main parts of the Galaxy page are the address. That's where you put the address of the server that you're using. We have the tool panel on the left, the center panel, the history on the right, and some um, important buttons at the top. When you run the tool, uh, when the job is finished, the output will be green. And then you can click on the eye icon next to that file and view the output of the file. One of the really useful buttons in Galaxy is this view all histories button, the top right of your history panel this button will give you access to all the histories that you've um, previously created in your Galaxy um, server. So it will show you all your analyses that you've done and you can switch between them. You can learn more about Galaxy Australia at this link here, um, where you can learn some of the key tasks. The Galaxy Australia project is part of the BioDevil project, which is led by Gareth Price. So we'll get started now. I recommend having one tab open at the Galaxy server, which is usegalaxy.org.au. And if you've got enough room and it's convenient, um, it might be worth having the training page open in another tab. So the training we're using today is galaxy-au-training.github.io slash tutorials. That's quite a long web address. So that's also linked into the schedule. <coughs> Excuse me. So if possible, have both tabs open so that you can see the steps we're follow following and what's happening in your Galaxy server. When you're looking at the training page, this top left hand button here will give you access to the menu and all the different tutorials available. Looking back at the schedule now, we now will log in to Galaxy Australia. So what we're going to do now, this is some background information to Galaxy Australia that you can read if you haven't yet used Galaxy. But the main thing for us to do now is to log in. So if everyone can open their internet browser, uh, you'll need to be connected to Wi-Fi. Then type in the address of Galaxy Australia, which is usegalaxy.org.au. Now, if you've used Galaxy before, Galaxy Australia, you can log in with your um, name and password 
If you haven't used it before, make sure you click register. It's free to register. And just let your local facilitator know if you're having any troubles on logging in. Well, one thing that's useful to do with Galaxy once you've logged in is just refresh your web page just to make sure Galaxy knows that you are definitely logged in. I'm just going to wait a minute while everyone logs in. Okay, now I'm going to start with a brief introduction to RNA-seq. Um, as I said, if you haven't logged in successfully yet to Galaxy, please let your facilitator know and they can help you log in. Sorry, my desk is a bit squeaky. <laughs> okay, so now we'll look at RNA-seq. So briefly, I want to go over uh, what gene expression is, what RNA-seq is, and the main analysis steps that we would do in an RNA-seq um, analysis. So that would involve the, oh, I just, people are having some trouble connecting. I'm just gonna wait a minute while everyone connects properly to Galaxy Australia. Uh, please let me know on the chat window if you are still having trouble connecting. Hopefully everyone's almost still connected. Okay, I think I'll continue, but as I said, please let us know if you're still having trouble. So in RNA-seq, we are going to cover some of the main steps, which are taking our raw sequencing reads, mapping them to a reference genome, quantifying, so counting the number of reads per feature in the genome, and then we want to test whether between two groups of samples, whether some genes were expressed more in um, or less in one of the groups of samples. So this is what we call differential expression. So I'll start with gene expression. Um, in molecular biology, uh, no doubt everyone is familiar with what we call the central dogma. And in a sense, this is an information flow. It's a flow of information from DNA to RNA to protein. So that is also what gene expression is. Gene expression is the taking the information from DNA and um, translating it into a protein. So the gene is said to be expressed. So there are lots of reasons we might care about testing for differential expression between two or more groups of samples. We might want to look at a certain drug and whether it's affecting how certain genes are expressed in a particular group. We might want to look um, at cancer patients, so tumour cells and healthy cells. Uh, or we might want to look at bacteria to see whether some bacteria are sensitive to antibiotics or whether they're resistant to them. 
So there's really a lot of different applications for differential expression analyses. <coughs> RNA-seq. Uh, most RNA in cells is actually either ribosomal RNA or transfer RNA. But in differential um, expression analyses, we actually want to look at the messenger RNA. That is the proxy for gene expression. The messenger RNA might only be 5% of the total RNA in a cell. So on this diagram, we can see we have DNA and then RNA gets made from the DNA. That makes a transcript, a messenger RNA transcript, and then that's translated into a protein. So we might be really interested in this protein and, and the abundances of different proteins. But it's actually very difficult to measure the amounts of different proteins in a cell. We can usually fairly easy, easily determine which proteins are there, but the amounts of them is quite difficult to measure. So it's easier to measure this messenger RNA, these transcripts. So what we do is we measure these transcripts because they indicate to us which proteins are abundant. The method of RNA-seq, this is obviously very simplified, but the main steps in RNA-seq are that we want to firstly get our messenger RNA. So that means either selecting for that messenger RNA or depleting some of the other RNA, such as ribosomal RNA. Then we want to take our RNA and we want to fragment it. Then we want to turn it into DNA because it's easier to sequence DNA than it is to sequence RNA directly. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we attach adapter sequences and then we amplify all those little pieces using a PCR and then we send them through for sequencing, for example, in an Illumina sequencer. So that's the basic method. There are obviously many um, variations on this and um, you can get more complicated than that but that's the main steps. And then our output from RNA-seq is that we have all of these reads. Each sample gives us all of these little sequences that are RNA sequence, but they actually start from random locations within those original transcripts. So there's, there's little pieces and they're from all these different spots in our transcripts. Uh, currently, they're around about 100 bases. Um, but the main point is we just need to know where they came from so that we can locate them in the genome and match them with a feature. So in an example experiment, we might have two conditions of interest. We might have a mutant condition versus the wild type condition. We might have um, a treated sample versus an untreated control sample. And our aim is to find the set of genes that are expressed differently between these two conditions. So we start with our raw reads. These are usually fast Q reads if we're using, um, for example, Illumina sequencing. You might be familiar with fast Q reads um, already or from some of our other workshops. So this is a file that contains the little sequences, the fast Q um, sequences, and they have the quality scores associated with each base. So we have the read, the actual sequence for the read, and then a measure of quality for each of those nucleotides. Those quality scores are encoded by these characters and they can be interpreted by the software. So that can help us with some of our quality control. The next important step, and this can be quite a slow step in RNA-seq analysis, is read mapping. So this is where we want to take all of our reads and map them, align them to our reference genome or reference transcriptome. So we need to remember that we've sequenced these transcripts and not the actual whole genome. We only have a part of the whole genome and we need to map it back to that genome. We also need to remember that reads can have errors uh, caused by sequencing errors. So there can be changed bases or inserted bases or deleted bases.
So in this mapping or alignment step, we are assigning every read to its location in the genome or the transcriptome. We may map only part of the read. <clears throat> I should point out there are some new tools that actually do this step a little bit differently. They call it pseudo alignment. So they, they're not really fully aligning every read with um, a position in the genome. They actually do it by comparing KMAs. Um, and then they can also do quantification at the same time. So they'd be worth looking into if you are working with RNA-seq and if you haven't heard of them before. Because uh, that does speed it up quite a lot because it's not doing this very time consuming step. When we are mapping these reads, there are several considerations and several options that we might change in the tool to account for some of these considerations. So some of our reads might map to several places in the genome. That could be because the genome has repeated regions, uh, such as genes that are paralogous. So we have to decide on a strategy. We can ignore any read that maps in multiple places. We can randomly choose one of the mapping places. We can use all of the mapped places. This is just something we have to decide with when we work with these tools. We may also have unmapped reads, and that's another consideration. Do we ignore these reads? Do we do something else with them? Um, these are all things that we would keep in mind when we were designing our RNA-seq analysis. After we've done the alignment step, we get what we call is a SAM file. So this, is, this stands for a sequence alignment map. And this is a really, really big file because every line is an alignment of a read and its position where it aligns. So it's sort of like a huge spreadsheet. It's very inefficient um, to store. So there is a binary version of this file, which is compressed. And this is known as a BAM file. So you've probably heard a lot about SAM files and BAM files. They um, represent the same thing. One of them is a compressed version. So today we will be producing some SAM files following our alignment of our reads to our genome. We will also view our alignments today. This is something you might not always do in an RNA-seq analysis, but I think it's a good way to understand what we're doing. So after we've aligned all of our reads, which are represented here in red and blue little bars, after we've aligned them to the genome, we're actually going to have a look at them and we're going to look at an alignment from two conditions. So we might start to get an idea of which particular genes have been expressed more or less in each of the two conditions. Then in the analysis, we need to do the quantification step. So this is where we're counting the number of reads per feature, and we can choose which feature to use, such as a gene or a transcript. We will use the tool today called HTSeq Count. And here's another example of something that the tool needs to um, consider. When it's counting these reads against the genes, there's a lot of ways it can decide whether or not to assign that read to that gene. So when we work with these tools and these parameters, this is something we need to think about. So for example, in the very top one here, we have the gene and the green read. Well, that's obviously, you would assign that read to that gene. In the second case, if the read hangs over the gene, you might need to, to decide whether or not you would assign that read to that gene or not. And there are sort of any, any number of complications with this. So we need to make these decisions when we run these tools. After we've counted all of those um, reads against their um, genes, we end up with an expression matrix. And it might look something like this. We have the genes down the left-hand side, so the names of the genes, and then we have the names of the samples across the top, and then in each of the cells we have the count. So this is called an expression matrix or a count matrix. So then we want to test for differential expression. So going back a minute, we can see if one of our sample groups is WT, such as wild type, and one is KO, 
we can see the wild type samples at 155 and 167 and KO 195 and 122. So it's not very easy to tell whether those two counts are statistically different. So we need to do statistical tests. There are lots of tools available. Um, you might have heard of some of these tools or other tools. We will use the tool Voom today. That's quite a well-known tool and works quite well. Um, but there are lots of tools. So you might have heard of EDGAR or DESEQ. And they all have different assumptions. Um, and there's a lot of research going on currently into which tools are the best, which approach is best. So it's, it's an active area of research. Uh, some people would use multiple tools and compare the results. So when you've done this statistical test, we get an output which is a list of genes. It's usually sorted by the p-value or the adjusted p-value. And, and that's how we can get our list of genes that are differentially expressed. We decide on the p-value to use as the cutoff. Just wanted to have a note about fold change. That's something we talk about a lot in gene expression. Fold change is a way of talking about how much a gene, um, its expression has differed between two conditions. So if we have condition A, and the expression is a unit of 1,000, but in condition B, it's 4,000, the fold change is four. So it's a way of representing that change in expression. If it's 1,000 in A and 2,000 in B, the fold change is two. We often talk about log fold change. So if the fold change was four, the log fold change would be two. And the reason we do that, one of the main reasons is that it actually looks very nice on a plot. So today you'll be seeing that one of our results is log fold change, and that's the reason that we are using that. So in today's workshop, so we're measuring this differential gene expression using data from bacterial RNA-seq. And we want to see whether our genes are express, expressed differently in this treatment group or the control group. So in a really simplified sense, I tried to represent this graphically. First thing we need to do is take these reads and map them to the genome. So if we have two groups of samples, control samples and treatment samples. We get our RNA out of those samples. And then we need to map it to the genome. The second thing we need to do is count the number of reads per gene. So in this case, maybe both sets of samples have the same expression of gene A, but maybe they differ in their expression of gene B. Then we need to make this counts table or expression table or expression matrix. They're all, all the same thing. They are this table of the genes versus the samples. Then we need to test whether those two groups of samples have different counts. We can look at them, but we really need to do it statistically. And then we get our result, which is this differentially expressed gene list. So again, this is our list of our genes, usually sorted by this adjusted p-value, which we cut off at some point that we decide is appropriate. And it often has this log fold change column. So this is the amount that the expression has changed between the two conditions. So slightly more complex. This is a Galaxy workflow of what we're going to do today. What we will do is we will start with our input files, which are our RNA-seq reads from two conditions. Um, these are from E. coli bacteria. And we also start with a reference genome. Then we are mapping these reads to that reference genome. So we end up with six mapping files, which are our BAM files. Then we're going to have a look at our mapped reads using the tool JBrowse. Then we'll make a count matrix. So we'll take all of our BAM files send them to the, another tool and make this count matrix. And we'll run statistical tests on that matrix. And we'll end, out, end up with our list of differentially expressed genes. 
and this is what it might look like. So main things to remember that that list, wherever we decide that significance level should cut off, that, that is sort of arbitrary. So we never get this sort of perfect, unquestionable output where we go, these are definitely the genes that are different, differentially expressed between our groups of samples. You always need to remember that that is really um, somewhat arbitrary. And we also need to remember that that list might contain false positives or be missing truly differentially expressed genes. Oh, I found this really nice um, paper the other day. Um, it's a preprint, but I, I highly recommend it if you're new to RNA-seq. It's a really good overview of the, the topic. And they make the point that obviously the, the thing we're doing with um, differential expression analysis is really to identify that set of genes that are changing in their expression levels and then using that information for further analyses. So one of the things we might do um, after we had identified the set of genes is perhaps look at the, um, the pathways that those genes are involved in. So the tutorial link is here. It's also in the schedule. And um, you can follow along with me as I do it. I'm gonna do it fairly slowly. Um, and please, uh, note in the chat window if I'm going too fast or if something's not working. And again, I should uh, point out the link to this discussion board uh, is here in the schedule. And so please also ask any questions uh, welcome in there. And you're also welcome to answer any questions in there. Um, if, if anyone hasn't been able to log in, could you just let me know in the chat? But I think we should all be okay. <coughs> okay, so to do our tutorial today. So this tutorial is part of a, um, a group of tutorials that we have for training in Galaxy Australia. Um, you can see the, the, um, the index on the left, and we are looking at RNA-seq in bacteria. So to start with our input data, I'm just going to open my Galaxy at the same time. So I'm going to drag my Galaxy tab out and RNA-seq open. Getting a bit small, but I think we can see it. Okay. Okay, so make sure you've got your Galaxy window open, that you're logged in, that it says that you're logged in, and um, that you've got a history. Um, you'll probably just have a blank history here. If you don't and you want to create a new one, you can just go to History Options with this cog icon and click Create New. But if it's just blank, feel free to use the current blank history. Okay, so for our input data. So this is a really simplified example. Um, we are going to be showing two conditions and each of those conditions are going to have three replicates. So we're going to have six input samples in total. These um, samples are in fast Q format. Uh, and we are using single end reads. So we only have one file per sample. These have actually been reduced to 1% of their original size for this tutorial so that it can run in time. So the counts we'll see later on are quite low and that's why, because we reduced the original data set right down. 
So this is from E. coli bacteria, which has been grown in two conditions. They've got little prefixes which refer to the original experimental conditions. So we have LB, which are the wild type, sort of in a sense, the control group. And we have MG. So these ones have been grown in a sugar solution. So you'll see some files labelled LB and some MG. We also have a reference genome in FASTA format and we have a gene annotation file in a GTF format. So this FASTA file contains that actual DNA sequence of the whole genome, the whole E. coli genome. And the GTF file uh, lists the coordinates of particular features in that genome. Okay, so hopefully we're all logged in to Galaxy Australia, use galaxy.org.au. We're going to use shared data, uh, which, is, which is good. So it's already loaded into Galaxy. We just have to go and find it. In the top menu, go to this bar called Shared Data, and then click on Data Libraries. And we have a data library in here, which is a collection of data files for a lot of our training material. And it's called Galaxy Australia Training Material. So if you just go looking for that, Galaxy Australia Training Material, we're going to use the RNA-seq data. And we're using microbial RNA-seq. So click all of those files. You can click this little box at the top. It'll select all the files. And then we want to send them, we want to import them into our history. So click to history up the top and then as data sets. You can give your history a name or you can just import it into your current history. I think I'll make a new one and I'm going to call it RNA seq. And then you can click on this green area here. If you ever don't know where you are in Galaxy, you can, oh, you can always click on this top left Galaxy Australia icon. It will bring you back to the main Galaxy page. Okay, so I've got my files in my history. Just a refresher of what we did. We went to shared data, data libraries, Then we looked for Galaxy Australia training material, RNA-seq, microbial RNA-seq. And then we imported all of those files to our history. So we've got all these files here. Um, the names are quite long, so I'm actually going to do a step where I rename these file names. This is not essential, but it makes it look a little bit neater. So what we're going to do is rename each of these files using the pencil icon to the right of each file name. So if you fi find that pencil icon, I'm going to minimise the left-hand side of my Galaxy window. I'm going to just give it the name where it starts with E. coli and save. So I'm going to do that for each of my files. We do have a file in here um, that we're not using at the start. Um, so that's called JBrowse. 
So we're going to use that later on. So don't worry about that file for now. So at the end of this, we should have three E. coli LB FASTQ files and three E. coli MG FASTQ files and two um, reference files. Okay, so that step is not essential, but um, if you've done it, it makes it look, look a little bit neater. The next step we need to do is to convert one of our file formats. So in the tool panel, I'm going to search for GTF. And this shows me all of the tools that um, are related to that search. And the particular tool I'm looking for is the GTF to GFF converter because we want to convert our file, which is currently in a GTF format, to a slightly different format, which if you work in bioinformatics, you know that's a common thing that we want to do. I'm just going to pause for a minute while we all get up to that step. Okay, so this step is a file conversion step. So one of the files we uploaded was a GTF file and we're gonna convert that. So in the tools, search for GTF. So there's a search bar in the top of your tool panel. If you enter GTF into there and press enter, we will get a list of the tools that might be relevant that we might wanna use. And we are going to use GTF to GFF converter. The file we're going to convert is our GTF file. Galaxy's already found it for us in this drop down box, so that's good. And then click execute to run that tool. We can see when we set our job to run that it's grey and that's waiting um, to be queued and when it goes yellow we'll know that it's started to run and when it's green it will be ready to view. So 
So <clears throat> just to re reiterate, we went to the tool panel, searched for GTF, clicked on GTF to GFF converter and gave it our GTF file. So that can run there now. We don't need to use it right now and we can continue. So the next step is aligning all these reads to a reference genome. So once again in the tool panel, we're going to search for map with BWA mem. So the one we, oh, Galaxy's unhappy. Let's refresh. I'll just wait a minute while um, Galaxy gets happy. Ask Okay, just waiting for it to reload. All right, thank you. You're putting the wrong address. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> Okay, mine's back. Hopefully everyone else's has refreshed. If yours dropped out, just check you're still logged in by clicking on user and just clicked it says that you are still logged in. Otherwise log in again. Okay, so I'll continue on, but please let me know if your Galaxy is not um, working. So what we're doing in this step is we're aligning our reads. So we're going to use the tool BWA mem. So I'm going to search for that BWA mem. And I'll click on that tool. Okay, so let's make my screen a bit bigger. So what we want to do here is click on this drop down list and we want to use a genome from our history. So I'm going to click on that option. And then we want to use the following data set, E. coli K12 faster. So that's already um, selected. We can leave quite a few of the things as their default settings. So single or paired end reads, we want to change that to single. And then we want to tell it our fast few data sets to use. So we have an option to tell it to use multiple data sets by this icon in the middle. We click on the multiple data sets icon. We can actually expand this box by clicking on the corner. And then we wanted to use all of the files, but not the faster file. I'm just going to wait there while 
um, we'll get reconnected to Galaxy. Okay, just let me know on the chat if you have reconnected and you're ready for the next bit. Okay, I'll keep going, but um, let me know if you need me to repeat this bit. Uh, so what we're using, doing is we're using the tool BWA Mem, we're putting in the settings as per the tutorial. So we're using a genome from our history. That genome is the E. coli FASTA file. We're using single end reads and we're giving it our six FASTQ files. That's all we need to change in this tool. And then we can click execute. So Galaxy will now queue up um, six files, um, which will be our BAM files. So these are, remember these are our sequence alignment map, our SAM files um, in a compressed form, which is the binary version of that SAM file which is called a BAM file. So you'll probably have six jobs queued in your Galaxy history. Um, just a reminder um, via the chat, thank you. Just wanted to remind you that when you're doing RNA-seq, it does, um, the tools that you use do depend on whether you're using um, bacterial or eukaryotic data um, because eukaryotic genes have introns in them, which means that your transcript is actually several exons sort of joined together. So when you try and map this back to a genome, you might have lots of gaps in that gene, the introns in the gene. So you will need a, an, an aligner that knows that these gaps are going to be there. So you. These are called splice aware aligners. Um, so that's something you need to keep in mind with. We are using um, bacterial data. The um, transcripts back to the genome. EF to GFF. If that's still running, um, that's okay because we, we are not using that just yet. So that can run for a little while. Um, but this step here, this aligning step, is one of the longer steps in the analysis. So these might be grey for a while, well, could because we're all doing it at the same time, so they might be queued.
when we have um, when, when this analysis is finished, we are going to rename these files. We're going to shorten the file names. When we do an analysis in Galaxy, Galaxy gives a number to that file so that when it uses it downstream, it can refer back to the file that it was using. So that's why there are all these numbers in our output files. It's a way of Galaxy and you keeping track on exactly what you did. So if your numbers are slightly different to mine, that's okay. Um, that doesn't affect the analysis. It's just unique to your particular history in Galaxy. So this might take five minutes or so. So I'm going to have a look in the discussion board while everyone's jobs run here. Let me know if you want me to repeat these steps again. So hopefully everyone's jobs are queued or even running and we're just going to wait a few more minutes for those jobs to finish. So while we're all waiting for our jobs to run, I um, just want to point out that there is a way to see how busy Galaxy is by looking at the home page and there's a graph of how many jobs are running. I'll just see if I can bring it up now on the home page. So you can see the graph here. So that, that can be useful to have a look at 
if you're about to run a big job, um, perhaps you want to wait till it's a little bit quieter because uh, um, it does get quite busy at times. Also on this home page, there's a link to the training material. So if you need to find that at another time, the link's here. And as I was talking about before, good to always look at the data storage policy um, for any Galaxy server that you're on because all the storage policies are a little bit different. So always make sure you know what Galaxy is saving and how long it's going to save it for. Galaxy is not really designed as a data storage um, thing. It's, it's really for you to do your analysis and then take your data um, and store it somewhere else but it does store it for some time. If you want a particular tool or a reference data set, there's a link here for requesting that as well. So there's a question on the discussion board about the difference between the p-value and the adjusted p-value. When we look at that output with our list of genes and um, sorted by the adjusted p-value, um, in a really general sense, the adjusted p-value means it's been adjusted for this multiple testing. So um, that's the one we want to look at. Uh, and it's also sometimes called the false discovery rate or FDR. So if you see FDR or adjusted p-value, that's the thing we want to look at when we look at this table of genes. So in my galaxy now, um, some of my BWAMM mapping jobs have started, so they've turned yellow. So we've got some good questions on the discussion board and good answers. So please um, feel free to ask any questions on that discussion board.
Oh, we have a question. What is the difference between the FASTA and the FASTQ file? So the FASTA file is just the sequence information. The FASTQ has also those quality scores for every um, position in that sequence. So while we wait for our BWA mem tool to finish running, we can actually set up our JBrowse file to start running. So I think we'll do that now in the interest of time. So JBrowse is this tool that will show us how our reads aligned to our reference genome. So if we go to the tool panel and we search for JBrowse or one word, and click on not the JBrowse data directory, but the JBrowse genome browser. So what we'll do is we'll have a practice here with setting up this JBrowse file. Um, this one takes quite a while to run if we're all gonna run it at the same time. So after we set it to run, we'll actually look at a completed file rather than waiting for it to finish in the tutorial. So I'm going to hide my two E. coli K12 faster file. We want to produce a standalone instance, so we click yes. We need to tell it the correct genetic code to use because this is bacterial data. So we tell it to use number 11, the bacterial code. Um, some of these settings we can keep as default. But the things we wanna do, do now is set up what we call tracks. So these are the, the information that we display underneath our reference sequence. So to do this, we have to insert a track group. So you can see a little plus next to insert track group. So click on that. We will give it a name. 
So under track category, I'm going to call this RNA seq reads. So this track, this line of information is my RNA seq reads. Then I will um, click another plus button, the insert annotation track. And we have to tell it what type of file is, is this? And this is a BAM piler. So in the drop down menu, we can see lots of file type options. We want to select BAM piler. Ones we might want to show. Let's pick. Um, So let's pick um, okay, and then we want to click auto generate SMP track, click yes. So we want to set up another track now. I know it can look a little bit confusing, but if you scroll down a bit. Once again, we can see insert track group here near the bottom. So I'm going to click that again, insert track group. And this one is going to be our annotated reference. So again, click insert annotation track. Um, you can leave that one selected, the GFF features file. That's the track type here. And this time we want our convert, converted file. So if for some reason your conversion hasn't finished, that's okay. Um, because we're going, this is just an example how you would make a JBrowse file. And I'll show you how to get the JBrowse file in a minute. But if your conversion file has finished, that's the file we want here. So that's the, it will probably be labeled GTF to GFF file. And I'll repeat all of this again in a minute. We can leave those other options as default, scroll all the way down and we can click execute, which I won't click now because I'm just going to show you again what we did. So just as a refresher, so if you've clicked yes to execute your file, you might notice that it's queued or you might even notice that it's got a red cross against it. And that's because we're not actually going to run the file today. We'll, we're going to use an existing file, but I wanted to show you how you would set it up so you can do it another time. So to repeat what we did there, we went to the tool panel, we searched for JBrowse, all one word. And we clicked on JBrowse Genome Browser. So that's, that brings up what I call the tool interface in that center panel. I'm going to collapse both my tool panel and my history panel so I've got more room. So uh, we need to tell it the reference genome to display. Click the drop down menu, click user genome from history. Tell it to use the E. coli K12 fast file. It's taking a while to load, there we go. So it's blue. We want to produce a standalone instance, so that would be yes. So genetic code, because we're using bacteria, we need to scroll down and find the bacterial code. And now we need to do um, 
the part of where we set up two tracks. So each time we set up a track, we click Insert Track Group. We can give it a name if we want to, just makes it a little bit um, easier to see. So I'm going to call this RNA Seek Reads. Then Insert Annotation Track. This one is BAM Pileups. We are going to use, um, we just want to look at two files here um, from two of the different conditions. We haven't had a chance to relabel them yet, but we can still click on two that we know are from different um, conditions. We will auto generate the SNP track. Okay, now we need to set up our second track. So scroll down till we get to insert track group, call it annotated reference. Insert annotation track. And this one is a GFF type of file. So the track type, we need to select GFF features and then tell it to use the file that we made earlier where we converted a GTF file to a GFF file. So tell it to use that file. We can leave all the other things as default. And that's when we would click execute. So you can click execute or you can wait and I will tell you how to get this file so we can have a look at it. Just doesn't have time for us all to run it at the same time on Galaxy at once. So we'll go and have a look in Galaxy again. Okay, so in my um, Galaxy instance, I can see that my, my mapping files are still running. Oh, two of them have finished because they're green and four of them are still running. So if I had set my JBrowse um, file to run, that would still be waiting for all of those BAM files to be produced or whichever two that we've chosen to use. So, um, if that's what you did, it will probably still be queued. But now I'll show you how to get this JBrowse file um, so that we can have a look at how these reads are mapping. So at the start of this tutorial, we actually imported a completed JBrowse file. If you scroll down to the bottom of all your files in your current history, you should see a file that says JBrowse. If for some reason you can't see that file, a reminder that it's in the shared data. So we got it from shared data, data libraries, and then we got it from within the Galaxy Australia training material, RNA-seq, microbial RNA-seq. So that's where we got it from, but you will probably already have it. So let's have a look at this file. To look at a file, remember we click on the eye icon next to it. Can take a little while just to load up on your screen. I'm going to again, oh, just refresh Galaxy. Um, I'm just looking for my history. If, if your Galaxy dropped out, 
just press the refresh button. I'll just wait while everyone gets reconnected to Galaxy. So what we'll do now is look at that JBrowse file. So again, scroll to the bottom of your history and find the JBrowse file that we uploaded earlier and click on the eye icon. Hopefully this will work. I'm going to collapse my side panels again. So this is our JBrowse file showing us that representation of the reads mapped against the reference sequence. So um, we need to tick these tracks in the left hand side. Some of them are unticked, so I'm going to tick them all. We can use these plus and minus buttons to zoom in and out. So I could zoom all the way in. You can see I can start to see the um, gene annotations here, these blue blocks, and very small at the bottom are all these reads. I'm going to zoom in more. I'm going to keep zooming in. We can start to see the annotations on these genes and start to see our reads being mapped. I'm going to zoom all the way in so we can actually see the sequence of our reference sequence which is um, right in the center here. So this is the sequence of our reference genome and there's a six frame translation um, either side of that, three frames either side of that reference genome. So zooming out again, so what we did here we wanted to just have a quick look at how our reads were mapping from two of our different conditions. So we chose a file from, um, from the LB set of samples and the MG set of samples. And we displayed these under our reference sequence. I just want to say, if you're um, trying to use the JBrow job JBrowse job that you set to run, it might have been cancelled because we can't run them all at the moment. So instead, use the JBrowse file that we imported at the start of the tutorial. So scroll down to the bottom of all of your files in your green um, history panel and click the eye icon next to the JBrowse file. Then click um, tick all of these boxes on the left hand side so we can see all of our tracks. So what I've been doing is zooming in and out and what we might see as represented in this tutorial is that some of the, um, the reads in one of the conditions there might be far fewer reads in that condition. So we might see in the LB condition there are not very many reads, whereas in the MG condition, there are lots of reads. And this obviously isn't a statistical way to look at the results of this analysis, but it can just give us a, a visual understanding of how these quantities of reads are indicating to us how the genes are being expressed in the two conditions. So if I zoom out a little bit, it's a bit hard to see on the small screen, but for example, this top row here, which is the LB condition, we can see the reads mapped in this area of the genome. There seem to be possibly fewer reads mapped in the MG condition. So 
to reiterate, doesn't matter if your JBrowse job got cancelled this time. In, in a normal situation, if you were running JBrowse in an analysis, it, it wouldn't be cancelled, but in this tutorial setting, we can't run them all at the same, at the same time. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is to make our count matrix. So in the tool panel, we need to search for count matrix. The tool we want to use is SAM BAM to count matrix. So if you scroll down, there's one called Sam Bam to count matrix. So we searched for count matrix and we selected Sam Bam to count matrix because that's what we're doing here. We're taking our Sam files or our BAM files, which are the same thing, and combining them into this matrix of counts. So the gene model that we need to tell it to use is this GTF file. So that's, Galaxy's already found, it, found that file and, and put it in there. We need to tell it that our reads are stranded. So click the yes there under reads are stranded, yes. We can leave a few things as default in here. One of the things we want to do is tell it the feature to count the reads against. So if you scroll down and see GTF feature type for counting these reads against, we need to click transcript. And then we need to tell it to use these six um, BAM files. So just to repeat what we did, we search for count matrix, we click on the tool called SAMBAM to count matrix. This uses the HTSeq tool. We told it that the reads are stranded, so we clicked yes. We told it to count the reads over transcripts. So under GTF feature type, we selected transcript. And then we selected all six of our BAM files for it to use. And then execute. So this one might take a couple of minutes to run as well. Um, I can see that some of you are still waiting for some of your BAM files to finish. Um, I think I'll upload one of these files so that we can all have it. Uh, what we'll do is if you haven't been able to get your 
BAM files to complete. If you have got your BAM files to work, then don't upload the history because we don't want to overload the um, server. So for people whose BAM files are not green and they, they didn't um, finish, uh, what we'll do is we'll import the history. So if you go to Share Data, Histories, Uh, if you click on Published RNA-Seq Bacteria, and you should have a button at the top that says um, Import. So if you import that history, uh, you should get all of the files that we need. But if you already have the BAM files, like I said, don't import the history. Just keep using your current history. And this may take about five minutes, so I am going to um, mute for five minutes and have a read of the discussion board. Okay, um, so my job's taking quite a long time to run. This, this one does take a little bit of time to run and I guess with us all doing it at the same time, it's a bit slow. So what I think we should do is um, import the history for this workshop and then we can see this file. Um, I'm just gonna check that that's not going to Jam Galaxy Australia, if we all try to do that at the same time. If anyone's count matrix file has completed and is green. Can you just let your facilitator know and they can tell me in the chat window. Just want to know where everyone's at in their analysis. So this is this is a file that will be called BAMS to DGE count matrix. Um, it will be at the top of your history. Okay, but to import the history, this will give us the files so that we can look at um, the output files. So what we're going to do is go to Shared Data, Histories. And then we're going to click on Published RNA-Seq Bacteria which should be the third one down in that list. And there should be an option to um, import that into your current, or to make it your current history. So click um, that, that button there. And I'm just going to get a uh, history that I made of this one uh, previously. So just to repeat what we did, we went to shared data and histories 
and we imported the published RNA-seq history. So if anyone didn't get that history, can you just let me know, can the chat, can the facilitator let me know in the chat window? Okay, so now we can look at the output that we would have got um, when we made our count matrix. And this is called BAMS to DGE count matrix. So it might not be the very top of your history, but a little bit down, click on the eye icon next to that file. Um, and what we can see is a matrix. Um, if your file names have been quite long, your matrix might be quite um, sparse. But in the tutorial document, you can see if we had short file names, um, you can see what we get here is a matrix with the gene names down the left hand side and the sample names across the top. And then in each cell, we would have a count. So these are very low counts because we're using a very cut down data set. Um, just as a refresher of how we got this count matrix, what we did was, is we used a tool called HTSeq, um, HTSeq count. And we won't uh, repeat it here because it takes a long time to run. Um, but what we did was we, we searched for this tool in the um, tool panel. We clicked on SAMBAM to count matrix. We told it to use the GTF file we told it reads a stranded, that it should count over transcripts, and we gave it our six BAM files. Um, because we're having some trouble getting all of our BAM files to finish, um, some people's count matrix couldn't complete. Um, we're also having trouble getting the count matrixes, matrices for running time. So now we are using viewing this count matrix from an imported history. But this is how yours would look if it had run. So if you're in your imported history, it's the BAMS to DGE count matrix. And then it's this matrix of genes versus samples with counts in every cell. So it's a bit hard to see on mine because my file names are very long and my matrix is sparse. But in the tutorial document, um, we can see that it's a the matrix of genes versus samples. So then we need to test statistically whether the counts are different in our two groups of samples. So we're going to use a tool in Galaxy called Voom. So you can stay in this current imported history and in the tool panel we're going to search for differential count models. So type that into the search um, the search bar. Don't forget there's an underscore under um, between differential count. Okay, so we see there's an, a tool here called differential count models. I'm going to, no, I'm not happy with that. Mine's just taking a bit of time to load. Okay, so this is a tool um, which actually lets us use various tools for um, making, testing this differential expression. We're just going to use one of the tools today called Voom. So this is what we need to do in this 
tool interface. We need to tell it to use the count matrix. So click on that drop down arrow and we should find a file called uh, BAM CDGE count matrix. That's what we want it to use. We can give it a title. So I'm going to call it DGE using Voom. We need to tell it uh, which columns correspond to the MG samples and which correspond to the LB samples. So uh, under treatment, we need to find out which were our treatment files. Yours might have different names if they've been renamed um, to LB1 and LB2 and LB3. Um, that's going to be clearer, so I'm just going to change to that the same history that you're using. Okay, so just to reiterate what we're doing here, we're searching for differential count models. We're clicking on that tool. We are telling it to use the count matrix. We can give it a title. We need to tell it which samples are in the treatment, which are the MG files. And we need to tell it which samples are in the control to the LB files. So by default, this is set to run um, a tool called EdgeR. We're going to tell it not to run EdgeR. Uh, we're going to tell it not to run DESeq2. But we are going to tell it to run Zoom. So what we did was we gave it the count matrix, we selected which of our samples were in the treatment and which were in the control, and we told it not to use EdgeR and DESeq2, but we told it to use the tool Zoom. And then execute. And because we're using a published history, we can go straight to our output file. So we can look at the file that's already been created, which is DGE using Boom, um, the XLS file. And this gives us the file I was talking about in the introduction, which is our list of differentially expressed genes. So the contig is the name of the gene. Um, this has been sorted by the adjusted p-value, which we can see over here. So it starts with very, very small values. And we also have a log fold change. So this is the amount that the, the gene expression is changing between the two conditions. So in this case, the most statistically significant result is that this gene, PTSG, was expressed differently between these two conditions. But depending on where we set our, um, our threshold for that adjusted p-value would depend which genes we considered to have been differentially expressed. So just a reminder that that was the, the output file from that Voom test and we looked at that XLS file.
So we won't do this section here, but I, I explain in the tutorial material how we can actually look at that gene in the original matrix, just to get an idea of how those counts are differing between the samples. So that's something you can go back to and do later if you are interested, just to sort of verify that it's um, apparent in the count matrix, and then we actually statistically to test, test it using a tool such as a boom. We are going to have a quick look at Degust. Uh, before we need to do that, we need to download a file that we can use in Degust. So the file we want to use is our counts file. So in your history, see if you can find the, the counts uh, matrix. Click on that file to sort of expand the information about it. And then there's a disk icon to download that file locally to your computer. So download that file locally. So this was the count matrix. And then we're going to use a tool on the web, which is called Degas. We'll just have a brief look at this um, tool. It's a nice way to visualize a lot of your RNA-seq um, data. So we will open up the Degust file. We will click upload your counts file. Choose file. So this is the file that we downloaded. And then click upload. So we'll give it a name. I'm going to call it DGE in E. coli. Info columns, I will select Contig. Min gene read count, I will put 10. And then we will add the, um, the two conditions. So scrolling down, Click on the blue box called Add Condition. This will be, we'll call it Control. And we will select the LB columns. And then we will add another condition called Treatment. And we will select the MG columns. And then we can save changes and view. So this is just telling Degas some information about our file. We won't do the tour right now, but if you look at Degas again, it has a nice tour at the start. So just really briefly, there's a lot going on in Degas, but just wanted to give you an overview of things you can look at in it. Um, we have our two conditions here on the left. You can select the method that you want it to use for testing that differential expression. We'll again use the boom method. Then we have uh, various plot options across the top. And when we select one of these plots, we see a heat map displayed below it. And then at the very bottom, we see this table of genes, as we calculated already in Galaxy. Um, and these are displayed with their expression uh, level relative, um, relative to the control. So as we found in Galaxy, we, we use the same method. We found this gene, PTSG, uh, had the highest, well, the lowest um, p-value. Uh, here we're looking at FDR, which is equivalent to the adjusted p-value. And we can see its fold change, uh, the log fold change relative to the control is almost minus four.
So one of the things you, people would typically look at is the MDS plot. Uh, so there's multi-dimensional scaling plot. It's a way of reducing um, variation to um, fewer dimensions. It's a way to sort of visualise how your samples cluster. So in, a, in an ideal experiment, you'd probably want your um, conditions, uh, the samples in those conditions to cluster together. What we're seeing here, um, the biggest, um, the dimension with the highest magnitude is across the X axis. So our samples are clustered according to that X axis. So that's, that looks fairly good. I can't go into it in a lot of detail, obviously, but it's just nice to see the options that are available in Degust. We can see an expression plot, this MA plot. Each dot is showing the change in expression in one gene. So if you hover over the dot, you can see the gene name and information about it. And this y-axis represents the log fold change. The x-axis is the average expression. So there's a lot of information there, but just to give you an overview of what's available in Degust. There's a volcano plot, which is relatively new. Um, again, each dot is a gene. You can hover over them. And this time the log fold change is represented on the X axis. We also have parallel coordinates. What we can do here is we can set our cutoff to uh, quite a low value. Let's set it to 0 0.001. And if we set it that low, we can just look at some key differences. So what we can see here is that relative to the control, some genes have been expressed more in the treatment and some have been expressed less. But these are the ones that are significantly differentially expressed. We also have a, a heat map here. Each block represents a gene. And finally, we get this table of genes at the bottom. As we got in Galaxy, we get our names of our genes, our um, P, adjusted p-value, and our log fold change. And I, it's important to stress that um, the fold change is interesting, but in many cases in biology, perhaps even a small fold change might be important. So you can order this table by the actual um, fold change uh, value. Um, but also we need to keep in mind that small changes might also be quite important. We won't do this section today, but this just gives you some information about how you can then further investigate some of those genes in the list. Um, for example, you can use the NCBI website and look up more about the particular genes. That's just one way of finding out more about them. So we are just going to have a 10 minute break now. Um, I will have a look at the discussion board and when we come back, we will go through the uh, workflow for bacterial RNA-seq. So please feel free to ask um, any questions. Oh, just to clarify um, via the chat window, um, just wanted to clarify that in the Gust here, which has a lot of visual um, opportunities, we actually repeated that differential gene um, expression analysis when we clicked the method. So although we did it in Galaxy, you could also just do the whole um, expression analysis here in Degust. So you don't want to actually upload your Voom analysis results to Degust. You want to upload 
the file created in the previous step, which is the count matrix. So all of this information is in the tutorial. If, it, if some bits have been a bit confusing, um, I encourage you to have another look at um, the tutorial. But please do ask me any questions, uh, particularly in the discussion board, and we will come back at 4.15. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to pick up again where we left off. So what we did then was um, send our count matrix to um, the tool Degust on the web and we had a look at some of the graphs and some of the visualisations that Degust can produce. So all this information is in the tutorial document and um, if you want to get the history, um, you might have done this already during the tutorial, but if at another time you want to get the history for this analysis, there's information about how to do that in the tutorial document. I've put in a um, couple of references as well into the tutorial document that you might find useful. So what we're going to do now is just have a really quick look at how we can make a workflow after we've done an analysis in Galaxy. So there's a really, really simple way to do that in Galaxy. It's you can run your workflow however you want to. And then in your history, you can go to this cog icon, which is like the little circle in the top of the history panel. And then you click extract workflow. And this takes all of the tools and all of the parameters that you used and it chains them together into a workflow. So that's done that automatically. Just scroll down and check it all looks okay. And then we can click Create Workflow. If 
once we've done that, we can see we have an option to click on the edit button. Let's click on that. And that brings up what we call a workflow canvas, which is this graphical way of looking at our workflow. So the tools that we've used and the way that the inputs and the outputs are connected. So one of the first things that we would do is just drag it around a little bit so that it's a bit clearer. So we had our input um, GTF file, we had our faster file, then we had our fast Q files. We had two types of fast Q files. My history had two runs of the differential count um, tool, so I'm just going to delete one of those. So this was our output. We got our, our um, list of differentially expressed genes, and that was our Voom output. And if we want to keep the output, we click the star next to that file. The input to that tool was our count matrix. And the count matrix was made from all of our BAM files plus a reference, an annotated genome file. So you can see how these um, inputs and outputs are joined together. And our BAM files, going back a step, we had six BAM files and each of them was made from one of our input FASTQ files being matched to the input faster E. coli sequence style. So you can see that that's a really simple way to create a workflow of something that you've just done in Galaxy. It can be really useful if you want to use it again or if you want to add to it. So, like I said, you want to click the star icon next to any outputs that you want to keep. So we might also want to keep this JBrowse output where we looked at our read mapping. And we need to save. So in the very top right corner, there's a cog icon. Click on that cog icon and click save and that saves your workflow. We won't run the workflow now, but if you want to access your workflow, in the top panel there's a workflow tab, and this will keep all of your workflows um, stored. If you want to learn more about workflows, there's another tutorial on our Galaxy Australia tutorial page. Um, there's an introduction to workflows, so I recommend that if you want to learn in more detail, particularly if you want to create a workflow um, starting with that canvas, not starting with a completed history. So I'll do a quick wrap up of today's uh, workshop. So I'll just give a bit of a summary about what we did today. I know we covered a lot of material and some of it probably felt a little bit rushed, but hopefully um, if you want to go over that tutorial again, um, please use the tutorial material and you can log back into your Galaxy instance. So what our aims were today were to familiarise you with Galaxy Australia if you hadn't used it before, or just get you a little bit more familiar with it if you had used it in the past, we wanted to introduce just the main concepts of RNA-seq using this cut down bacterial data set and using some common tools. Um, obviously our introduction had to be quite brief and our data set is small. What we covered today, Galaxy. All the galaxies have a similar appearance. They have the tools on the left and the history on the right. 
and we use Galaxy Australia today. We looked at bacterial RNA-seq, where we went with this idea that the transcripts, the messenger RNA, was a proxy for how those genes are being expressed and turned into proteins. Proteins are hard to measure um, quantitatively, but mRNA, we can do, we can measure the amounts of mRNA. So that's one way of looking at this gene expression between conditions. Um, so we, we measure this sort of intermediary stage, this messenger RNA. We had our input data, which was six FASTQ files to uh, reference genome files. We use the tool BWA-MEM, which is a mapping tool to map those reads against the reference genome. And each one of those um, processes results in a single output file. So we ended up with six BAM files. And BAM files are a compressed version of a SAM file. We just wanted to have a look at how some of these reads were mapping. So we chose two of our BAM files and we made a JBrowse file. And we had a quick look at how the reads in one condition, um, we might be able to see the abundance of reads between the two conditions against particular genes. Then we made a count matrix. So we used this HTC count tool um, we searched for SAM BAM to count matrix and we ended up with this count matrix or expression matrix which is, which is the genes versus the samples and all of the counts. Then we tested that statistically using the tool Voom and we came up with our list of um, differentially expressed genes with their adjusted p-values and their log fold change. So the log fold change is the change in expression level and the adjusted p-value is the statistical significance. We also, when we went back a step, this count matrix we downloaded uh, locally and we also then uploaded that to Dagust, which is another way of looking at differential gene expression and it gives you a lot of nice plots. So for example, the MA plot or the volcano plot. But that also gives us our list of differentially expressed genes. And then we had a look at extracting the workflow. So we extracted it, we could visualise it on a canvas. We can see we've got our input, RNA-seq reads and reference genome. We mapped those reads to make six BAM files. We looked at the reads, we made a count matrix, and then we tested for differential expression. So for more information about RNA-seq, as I said, I've just put a couple of uh, references that I think are useful into the tutorial, but we do have further tutorials on our Galaxy Australia training website. And I'd also recommend the Galaxy Training Network, which is a global network of Galaxy training materials, and um, they have a lot of nice training materials on there. I once again like to acknowledge everyone involved in both the DEVIL project and EMBL ABR and all of our local facilitators and attendees. So thank you for coming and now I'm going to hand back to Jeff. Thanks Anna. Um, whilst we do the handover, I just wanted to say to everyone that the discussion board, um, it's been incredibly active. Uh, so thanks to everyone for asking questions and answering questions in there. Um, don't feel uh, that you need to rush away. So if you want to keep on writing uh, questions and comments into the discussion board, please do. And we will continue to answer those um, for the next um, half an hour or so. Right, so I'll just share my screen now. So first of all, I would like to thank Anna um, for, uh, sorry, share, okay. uh, 
Yeah, great. So um, first of all, I'd really like to thank Anna um, for delivering that um, training event. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending um, today's training. And just a reminder that this is the third of a series of four short introductions to Galaxy Australia. So um, if you're interested in metagenomics, uh, we have a session on the 14th of November, and that'll be the final in the series. So um, that is live now. So if you go to our events uh, webpage, which is www.mbolabr.org.au slash about events, you will see links to um, all of your nodes where you can um, register. Um, also, as I mentioned, this session has been recorded. Um, we will be editing out uh, various parts of it, but we're gonna make it available as we always do on our YouTube channel. Um, and the link to that is uh, here. And there's also links from our website. Um, we'll also be uh, uh, maintaining that discussion board as a, as a record of the event. So you can always refer back to that as well. So prior to you uh, running off, um, we would really love if you would be able to spend just a couple of minutes filling out an evaluation survey. Um, we're always interested in your feedback, both on the content as well as the delivery, this mode of delivery across the uh, country, countries, in fact. Um, we're interested in knowing what worked and what didn't work. Um, so there's a link to the survey at the bottom of the discussion board. Um, there's also a link to it at the bottom of the schedule. Um, and finally, just before we sign off, I'd like to acknowledge the funders who have made this possible. So Emble ABR as a network, we're supported um, by Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne. And as Anna uh, mentioned, the Galaxy Australia project has been uh, supported uh, by the ARDC, the Australian Research Data Commons, through the Data Enhanced Virtual Laboratory Program. So thanks very much. Um, the, as I said, the, you, the, the, this will be recorded and made available. Feel free to hang out in the discussion board for a while. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month. All right, thanks very much. Bye-bye.